All right, hello web chatterers, and thank you all for attending our session this evening. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Sindhu, who will be teaching us about radiology. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video at the end. With that being said, Dr. Sindhu, you may start whenever you're ready. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me, web chatterers. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about diagnostic radiology um, and just going through a little bit about what it's about, um, how to get into residency if you're interested in diagnostic radiology, and then I'll run through a few cases as well. So a little bit about me. Um, I did my pre-med studies at Cornell and Ithaca, and I majored in biological sciences and concentrated in nutritional sciences. Um, during my time there, I actually ended up also taking a bunch of English courses um, and literature classes because I was interested in that as well. And it allowed me to pursue some interest outside of medicine. Um, one of the, I think, <clears throat> common misconceptions um, with pre being pre-med is that you have to major in science. But if you want to go to med school, all you have to do is do the pre-med requirements. And I'm sure most of you guys already know that. So after undergrad, I went on to med school at Rowan in South Jersey, and I got my DO degree. Then I started my intern year at Northwell in Plainview. Um, I did a transitional year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that and what that is all about. And after that, I started my diagnostic radiology training in New Jersey. So... <clears throat> A little bit about life outside of medicine, since I think it's really important to have passions outside of medicine. Um, I'm married, I live in New Jersey with my husband. He's not in medicine, so I think it's kind of nice to have, um, you know, conversations after work and I share a little bit about what life is like in medicine and he shares his career with me. Um, we love just being outdoors and doing outdoor activities together. So. We loved going hiking and um, we recently took up skiing a couple of seasons ago. So that has been interesting as well. Um, I also create content on social media um, and share my various passions there. So I create a lot of medical content and share my experiences during residency and give advice about medical school and residency. Um, medicine has become such like a niche on social media and I love being part of that community and just being able to share my experiences and learn from others' experiences as well. So this is just how to get in touch with me. If you're interested, um, here's all my social media information. Um, I wanted to just leave this here in case anyone is interested in following along and getting more of a glimpse into what radiology residency is like. I'm also happy to chat with anyone looking for any career advice or school advice. So feel free to shoot me a DM or send me an email and I will do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. It might take a day or two, but I will respond. So let's get right into it. Um, what is radiology? So radiology is a field of medicine that utilizes a variety of image-based methodologies to diagnose and treat diseases. So we use uh, x-ray, ultrasound, CT, MRI, PET CT, and a whole, um, a whole bunch more of image-based methodologies. And then interventional radiology is a subset of radiology. So interventional radiologists use various imaging modalities to perform uh, minimally invasive procedures and treatments. So how to become a radiologist? So you have to go to undergrad and complete all of the med school prerequisite courses um, and successfully complete the MCAT as well. And then once you've done all of that, you can apply to medical school. So in the US, you can apply to either DO or MD programs. Um, and in med school, you have to successfully complete your board exams. So I often get questions about whether someone should go the DO route or the MD route. I think they're both really great options um, in terms of academics. You know, MDs and DOs take the exact same courses. Um, they take like biochem, they take uh, neurology, et cetera. And then DOs take an additional course called osteopathic manipulative medicine or OMM. 
And that focuses on a deep understanding of an appreciation for the musculoskeletal system and the lymphatic system. So we learn about um, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and their attachments, their movements, and the lymphatic system as well, and how to manipulate those structures manually to diagnose and treat diseases. So I used my OMM skills in med school a lot and during my intern year as well. I don't really use them that much as a uh, radiology resident just due to the nature of my work now, but um, I'm always doing OMM on my friends and family members and I just think it's a great skill set to have. So MD students have to successfully complete the USMLE step one and step two exams and then DO applicants have to successfully complete the COMLEX board exams, um, levels one and two. So in addition to doing the COMLEX exams, a lot of DO students also take the USMLE exams. Um, and that's what I did as well when I was in med school. Um, I took both level one and level two and then step one and step two. Um, so then after that, after all of those exams are done, MDs and DOs can apply to residency and um, if you're interested in radiology, you have to apply to both a prelim intern year program and radiology programs. So that often means like two separate personal statements, one kind of tailored more towards the prelim program and one tailored towards the diagnostic radiology program. And it also means twice the number of applications and twice the number of interviews, but it's all worth it because if you're interested in radiology, that's kind of like the culmination of all your hard work that you've done up until that point. Um, so in terms of the different options for your prelim year, um, there's a preliminary medicine year, a preliminary surgery year, and then a transitional year. So a prelim medicine year is basically just one year of being an internal, me internal medicine resident. So you're rounding on patients, you're seeing patients every single day. Um, oftentimes you're working in a clinic and you're just basically an IM resident. Same for surgery. Um, if you do a prelim surgery year, you're basically a surgical resident for the year. So you're assisting with surgeries, you're seeing patients, all that fun stuff. Um, a lot of people who are interested in doing interventional radiology do the prelim surgery year just so that they get that um, hands-on and kind of surgical experience that will prepare them for life as an interventional radiologist. And then the third option is a transitional year. Um, and that's what I ended up doing. I applied to both prelim medicine and transitional year programs. I knew I did not want to do um, a prelim surgery year, kind of wanted to enjoy my intern year a little bit. So I did a TY year and a tr transitional year is basically um, an, an intern year of residency where you rotate through the different medical specialties. So we, we did about six months of internal medicine. So I got that experience. We did a month or two of surgery and then the rest of it was elective time. So we could rotate through the different fields of medicine, um, which I thought was really great. So it's a little more broad. It lets you experience different fields of medicine prior to your dedicated residency training in radiology. And I got to see how the different fields of medicine interact with, inter interact with radiology during that year. Um, and I got to experience different fields of medicine that I was interested in from a physician standpoint, um, rather than just from a medical student standpoint. So then you go on to radiology residency. Um, so from your postgraduate years two through five, PGY two through five, you do your diagnostic radiology residency. Um, and yes, four years is a long time, but radiology pretty much encompasses the whole body. So there's a lot of information that we have to know, and that's one of the reasons why it is so long. Uh, we have to know pretty much every disease state that can affect the body. We need to know what normal looks like on every single type of imaging modality and what normal variants look like as well. Um, we need to know what abnormal um, processes look like, what every single disease look like, and then what each abnormal thing correlates to, whether it's a disease or a pathologic process. 
So then after residency is over, we go on to do fellowship. Uh, most of these are one year. Interventional radiology is two years, but um, a lot of IR or a lot of uh, radiology residency programs have what is called ESIR so that um, residents who are interested in interventional radiology can do a lot of IR rotations during their fourth year of residency and then only have to do one year of interventional radiology fellowship after residency to become an attending physician. So these are all the different um, fellowships that we can subspecialize in. So there's abdominal imaging, breast imaging, cardiothoracic, MSK, neuro, neurointerventional, nuclear, peds, thoracic, and IR. So I'm just going to pull up the chat to see if there are any questions. So um, one of the questions is, why did I choose to attend a DO school over an MD school? Um, so I actually come from a family of physicians. Um, so my dad is an MD and my oldest sister is a DO. So I was kind of introduced to both of those pathways um, pretty early on. Um, my older sister went actually to Rowan as well um, back when it was UMD and J. So I got to hear a lot about her experience and I just felt that the um, DO approach to medicine in that it's more holistic and really focuses on preventative care um, really was what I was looking for. And um, that being said, I did apply to both MD and DO schools. I interviewed at both and I got into both and I just kind of went with my gut feeling about what I thought was better for me, what school I thought um, I would you know, enjoy more and thrive at. Um, and I ended up going the DO route, but, you know, I have friends who went to MD schools and friends who also went to DO schools and all in all, you'll have basically the same training. Um, it's just that DOs take the extra course in LMM. Um, so another question is about gap year. So I did not end up taking a gap year. I went straight through um, from high school to undergrad to med school to residency. I didn't take any time off, um, which at the time I didn't want to do. I wanted to take a gap year, but I kind of just sucked it up and just went all the way through. And now that I'm almost done with my training, I'm kind of happy that I did that, um, but I don't really have anything to compare it to. So my advice would be if you want to take a gap year and if you think that you'd be able to use your gap year in a way to advance your application, then that's something you should consider doing. Um, but if you kind of just want to go straight through, that's fine as well. Um, I don't really think there's a right or wrong way to do it as long as you can prove that you did something meaningful and useful with your time off. So one last question for right now, what kind of board scores would you say are competitive for a DO student for Comlex and USMLE? Um, obviously, the higher you can score, the better. That will just open more doors of opportunities for you. Um, for radiology specifically, in terms of Comlex and USMLE, um, in recent years, it has um, been a little less competitive, but I think it's trending back up again. So um, the advice that I was given when I was applying was that as long as you are at least scoring average on your complex and your USMLE, then you have a good shot at matching into radiology. I do know that it has been becoming um, a little more competitive in recent years. So um, obviously if you can do better on your um, board exams, that is never gonna hurt you in the long run. So um, moving on for now, um, I just wanted to give a few pieces of advice um, to, you know, all of the future physicians. Um, the first piece of advice is always remember that 
the days are long, but the years are short. And what that means is that sometimes the road can feel like it's never ending and the days just feel super long and you feel like you're not really getting anywhere and you kind of begin to question why you chose this path. Um, I know I experienced it in medical school. I am still experiencing it in residency because I am seeing my friends who graduated college with me. They're starting their careers. You know, they've been um, making quote unquote real money for five, six, seven, eight years now. Um, and those feelings of doubt and questioning whether you made the right choice sort of come up. But the thing that always grounds me and kind of brings me back to, you know, a sort of calmness is just reminding myself why I chose this path and remembering that my time will come as well and it'll come sooner than I think. So this actually just happened to me and my co-resident the other day. Um, we were talking about how residency feels never ending and how we feel like we've just been doing this for so many years and it's still not done and we still have so many years to go. But then my program director sent out our rotation schedule for the next academic year and next to our names on the schedule, it said PGY4, um, which is postgraduate year four. And we were like, wow, you know, we are in our fourth year of residency starting in July. It's kind of crazy how quickly the years are passing, even if the days themselves feel super long. And then one more piece of advice is I know how grueling and tough pre-med life and med school life are, you know, I went through them pretty recently. They're not easy by any means. Um, so don't be afraid to seek out help and don't be shy about taking help if someone offers it. Burnout isn't just prevented by self-care, it's prevented by people caring for one another. It's not worth it to go through these tough years alone. So don't be afraid to rely on one another and help each other out. Um, it'll make, you know, these years go by a lot easier and um, you'll come out with some really strong friendships once everything is said and done. And lastly, take a break if you need it. So if, you know, if you feel like you need a gap year, take a gap year. If you feel like you need to schedule a day off in residency just to have a day off to recover and relax, do it. Be kind to yourself. All right, so why radiology and why did I choose radiology? So radiologists are physicians' physicians. We work really closely with each um, medical specialty from um, pathology all the way to neurosurgery. So obviously each subspecialist in radiology works closely with one or two other medical specialties. So for example, a musculoskeletal radiologist works hand in hand with the orthopedic surgery service and the neuroradiology um, attendings work very closely with neurology and neurosurgery. So um, there's a great deal of diversity in the cases that we see because of that. Literally from head to toe, we see it all and uh, we are involved in the, pa the patient care um, with those attendings from other specialties as well. So radiology for me, I feel like is a good mix of hands-on and hands-off. I think a lot of people, when they think about radiology and radiologists, they think about doctors who sit in a dark room all day in the basement of a hospital um, and don't really talk to other people, but we actually have quite a bit of patient interaction. And as I mentioned before, we have a lot of interaction with our colleagues in other fields of medicine as well. And so this patient interaction for me specifically is really rewarding um, because when we see a patient, we kind of have an idea of what the problem is, what we need to tackle, and we can make um, a really meaningful impact during that patient visit. So when I did my internal medicine and family medicine rotations in med school and even during my intern year residency, I really enjoyed seeing patients. I enjoyed getting a history and doing a physical and using all the information that I obtained along with the lab work and imaging to come up with a diagnosis or at least a differential diagnosis. But once all of that was said and done and you know, after rounding for like two or three hours during the day, um, I felt like a lot of my time was spent just writing notes or doing chart review or putting in orders 
following up with consults and with social work and doing a lot of um, quote unquote management things that are very, very important, but don't directly involve the patient. So with radiology, whether you're reading the scan or you're doing a procedure, you're affecting the patient immediately and directly. And to me personally, that is more fulfilling. Um, so radiology is also great for those with a good attention to subtle detail. Oftentimes, you know, we'll have a patient, uh, a patient scan and, you know, the doctor taking care of them can't really pinpoint what's going down. Um, so we have to assess the images and kind of figure out, you know, what's going on, even if it's something very, very subtle that we only see on like one slice of an image or um, just a little portion of the image. If we can see that and provide some clues or provide an answer, that goes a long way in, um, you know, working as a member of the team and taking care of the patient. So um, radiology also, um, in terms of the procedures that we do, it's very hands-on. Um, some subspecialties of radiology are more hands-on than others. The three big ones are interventional radiology, mammography, and musculoskeletal imaging. Uh, radiology is also very technology focused and it's constantly evolving. So there's always new technology being created. Um, there are always improvements with artificial intelligence and advancements with that. And I think the next 10 to 20 years will be a really exciting time for radiologists as AI develops more and more and becomes more incorporated into our daily routine. Um, and the other great thing about radiology is the ability to subspecialize without losing out on your general knowledge. So uh, radiologists take call, uh, some of them take call um, if you're like in an academic setting and even the radiologists who subspecialize, um, you know, when they're on call, they're not just reading their subspecialty, they're reading pretty much every subspecialty with the exception for mammography. So um, say for instance, you have a neuroradiologist. When they're on call, they're going to be reading the neuro cases, the body cases, the musculoskeletal cases, and that kind of allows them to retain their general radiology knowledge rather than losing out on it. Um, that's not really something that you see in fields like uh, internal medicine. You know, once someone specializes in cardiology, they're not really going to be doing anything gastroenterology related or um, pulmonary related. They're just gonna focus more on their cardio patients. And lastly is lifestyle and flexibility and salary. So radiology has been traditionally known as one of the quote unquote road specialties. Um, and road implies that, you know, these are kind of the specialties that are more um, amenable to a good lifestyle. So it's radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesiology, and dermatology. So even though residency is not part of the road lifestyle and can be pretty tiring, after fellowship, there's a lot of flexibility about what you can do as a radiologist. Um, some radiologists work in VRAD, which is virtual radiology. So they can work remotely, they can work from home, they can be anywhere pretty much in the world. And as long as they have the radiology workstation, they can be reading for any hospital or any medical institution, which is pretty cool. Um, you have the flexibility to work part-time or work less hours. And if you don't want to uh, take a partnership track, you don't have to take call, which is really nice as well. So then procedures. So radiologists, as I mentioned, do a lot of procedures um, and we do a lot of cool hands-on stuff. And so I encourage all of you, whether you're pre-med or um, you're in med school or even during, you know, your medical school elective rotations, if you have an opportunity to rotate through radiology, even if you're not interested in becoming a radiologist, I would highly recommend doing so. At the very least, you'll get a feel for everything that we do, um, and it'll be really helpful for you regardless of what you decide to specialize in. So here's a list of some of the procedures that radiologists do. This is by no means exhaustive. We participate in all of these um, during residency, which is pretty cool um, because we get exposure to these and can kind of practice our skills 
as we advance through our training. So getting in on these from day one of residency really allows us to hone our skills with doing procedures. Um, we get comfortable holding the needle and you know, using a needle on a patient who's awake and alert. Um, we get comfortable uh, doing you know, IR procedures and using biopsy guns and we use imaging while we're doing all of these procedures. So that allows us to um, you know, practice obtaining the images, whether we're you know, holding an ultrasound probe or using the fluoro table. Um, we get comfortable maneuvering the images and maneuvering the patient to get the images that we want. And then also um, assessing the images in real time and acting accordingly based on what we see. So daily schedule as a resident, um, I won't go too in depth because it does vary from program to program. But if you're interested, I often do like little IG stories and Instagram posts um, and YouTube videos showing what a day is like uh, for me as a resident at my program. Um, I created actually a pretty in-depth vlog um, about what my day is like on my YouTube channel. So um, check that out if you're interested. And a typical day at our program starts at 745. We have morning didactic conference, which is usually uh, attending led or resident led. We also do a lot of conferences joint with other uh, medical specialties. So we do urology conferences and emergency medicine conferences. Uh, from 8.30 to 12, we are on our scheduled rotation. So all the residents are on different rotations uh, on any given day. And from 8.30 to 12, we're, you know, either picking up studies or doing procedures or a little bit of a mix of both. Um, so say for instance, I'm on the body imaging rotation, I'll be at my workstation and I'll pick up five or six studies, you know, a mix of ultrasounds, CAT scans, MRIs, that kind of stuff. And then I'll go over to my attending who's assigned to that rotation for that day and we'll review the scans and go over my dictation to see if there's anything that needs to be changed um, and you know, have a little bit of education at that time and kind of repeat that for the morning. From noon to one, we have our noon didactic conference and lunch. Um, so the didactic conference, again, is usually attending led. Uh, we do have some like journal club sessions and QA conferences and that kind of stuff. And then from one to 1.30, we have protected resident time. and. Even though this doesn't seem like a lot, those 30 minutes are really meaningful because it allows us to catch up on anything we need to catch up on for residency. Um, we can go upstairs to Starbucks and grab a cup of coffee and just kind of socialize with one another at that time. So it's, it's a really nice thing to have those 30 minutes just for ourselves. And then 1.30 to 5 p.m. is just a repeat of the morning again, depending on what rotation we're on. And then residency call. So no matter what, um, what residency you decide to do, regardless of the specialty, regardless of the program, you're gonna take call in one way or another. Um, and again, this will vary from program to program. For radiology specifically, it depends on whether a hospital has VRAD coverage, um, the number of residents at that program, if the attendings take call and what hours they take call. So typically um, we do weekday call shifts. So after a normal work day from 7.45 to five, uh, one resident is on a weekday call. And so they stay at the hospital and they do call from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. And they have an attending physician with them at that time. Uh, at 10 p.m., a night float resident comes in and they kind of take over and read all of the stat cases that come in through the emergency department and any inpatient stat cases as well. Um, and we just have one resident on at a time for night flow and we're kind of just by ourselves. There is no attending in-house. Uh, there's an attending at home that we can you know, call and um, if we need help, we can call them and have them pull up the images on their workstation. But other than that, we're on our own. And I'm actually on night float right now. So after this session, I'll be heading into the hospital for my shift. And then we do weekend day call shifts. So again, those are just, you know, working like a regular call shift, but 
it's 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday or Sunday. And for us, our call is front loaded. So we do the most call during our first and second years, which is really helpful. Um, it allows us to get used to the pace of the environment and see a lot of diverse cases and prepare us for night flow. Um, and then we take less call our third and fourth year when we're studying for boards and preparing for fellowship and all that kind of stuff. So I'll just pause here as well and just take a look at some of the questions. So um, regarding fellowship and whether or not uh, radiology residents do fellowship. So yes, I'd say about 99% of radiology residents go on to do fellowship. Um, there's really not much of a general radiologist anymore. Um, there are some that work with BRAD, but again, the more subspecialized you are, the more marketable you are, and that's uh, how institutions and hospitals and radiology groups are going to hire you and uh, bring you onto their team. Um, if you can offer a skill set that someone else can't do, that is really meaningful. Um, so did I do research in undergrad? Um, or scribing or shadowing. So I did research in undergrad. Um, I was actually part of a social development lab um, pretty much throughout my time uh, in university and got to do some really cool research projects there. I also did a lot of shadowing whenever I could. Um, I started shadowing in high school actually when I knew I was interested in going into medicine um, did some volunteer work at my hospital and slowly, you know, started just shadowing different physicians and different specialties to find what I liked. And that kind of led me to radiology. And I just, you know, kind of decided uh, late in high school that I wanted to do radiology. And ever since then, um, that feeling hasn't really wavered. Um, you know, your experiences and the things that you do in high school and in undergrad and med school are going to broaden your horizons. They're going to teach you things about how medicine works and how the world works. So if you have the opportunity to shadow or to volunteer or to be a scribe, just to get basically any uh, experience in medicine that you can, that's going to be helpful for you. How would you say the work-life balance is during medical school versus residency? Hmm, that's a pretty interesting question. So um, I don't really think that I had a work-life balance in med school um, just because, you know, I was living alone at that time. I was living pretty close to campus and I was just studying all day, every day. Um, working on research and doing extracurriculars and stuff like that. So I was basically just living and breathing med school for at least the first two years. Um, that kind of got better later on when I started my clinical rotations because I wasn't, you know, I had taken my step one. I was kind of in the, you know, behind me. I didn't have to focus on studying as hard and as much every single day. Um, but I'd say as a resident, you know, it, it is what you make of it. So the days are long. Yes. Um, you're going to be tired. You're going to, you know, have to come home and study as well, but I think there is a better work-life balance as a resident than there is as a med student, because in medical school, you're still a student, right? In residency, it's a job. So you have some structure, um, you know what you have to get done and you can come home and kind of you know, prioritize the things that you have to do, but still you'll have weekends off, you'll have days off, you're able to take vacation. And um, yeah, I definitely think there is better balance as a resident. So can you do more than one fellowship? Yes, you can do more than one fellowship. 
There are some fellowships that are joint. So for instance, there are joint body and mammography fellowships. Um, so for six months of the fellowship, you do body imaging and then six months you do mammography. Um, but if you're interested in you know, other things, you can always do another fellowship after your first fellowship is done as well. Um, all right, one more question. So how many hours a week do you work in residency? So this also varies depending on, you know, what rotation you're on, what year you're in and how much call you're taking. Um, but typically, again, our days are 745 to 5, Monday through Friday. And then um, in first and second year of residency, we end up working probably one to two weekday call shifts a month and one to two weekend call shifts a month. And then night flow um, also varies as well, but it's two weeks at a time and we end up doing eight weeks throughout the year. And for our program, it's every other night, um, anywhere from nine to 14 hours a night. All right, so moving on. So I wanted to just present a few cases to you guys. I know you're all at different levels of your training, um, but I thought this would be a good introduction to radiology and to the types of studies that we see, especially when we're on night flow and when we're on call. So the cases that I'm gonna show you, these are usually the ones that come in stat or emergent and need to be read immediately um, or as soon as possible. So one thing to remember um, when we're on call and when we're on night flow is that as radiologists, we are not seeing the patients. We just are provided a little bit of information, a little bit about the history, and then we have to interpret the images. Um, you know, we can dive into a patient's chart and read the ED provider note and look at the labs, um, but it's hard to do that for every single patient when, you know, studies just keep piling up on the list. So we really rely on our emergency medicine colleagues to, you know, give us a brief chief complaint and what they think is going on with the patient. And then we interpret the images to see if, you know, that is really what's going on. So, um, the general approach to any study that we read is number one, what type of study is being ordered and why is that being ordered? So um, is it a CAT scan? Is it an x-ray? Is it an ultrasound? You know, what type of imaging modality is being utilized? Um, number two is what is the symptoms or what is the mechanism of injury if it's a trauma patient? Obviously, that's going to clue us into where we should look. But with radiology, it's important to kind of have a systemic approach to every single study that you read. So say, for instance, a CAT scan is ordered on a patient and the ED tells me, oh, this patient is having right-sided back pain. When I open that CAT scan, I'm not going to jump immediately to the right back to look for what's going on. I'm going to you know, go through my method of interpreting a study and do that for every single study, every single time, go through it the same exact way. Because if I focus on just that right back pain, I might miss something that's going on somewhere else. But if I go through my you know, step one, step two, step three process of where to look and what to look for, it's you know, less likely that I'm gonna miss something. Uh, so next is the patient's gender and age. Obviously, you know, between male and female patients, there are different organs, there are different processes that can go on, and um, a patient's age also comes into play because some pathologic processes are more common in a pediatric population versus adult population and vice versa. Um, relevant medical and surgical history as well. This goes a long way. And um, we'll see an example of this in one of the cases that I'm presenting. Important lab values. Obviously, this is going to clue you into some things as well. Like if a patient has abdominal pain that's generalized and you don't really know where to look, if their lipase is elevated, that could clue you in to look at the pancreas. You know, maybe they have acute pancreatitis. Um, or if they have blood in the urine, maybe they have a kidney stone. So look at that. So uh, important lab values. Um, is something that we always check. And then prior imaging. So um, comparing 
a, a new study to prior imaging is very, very important because it allows us to see what's new or if we see something that doesn't look right, if it was on the prior imaging, we know that this is something that's likely to be chronic and not something that's acute. So um, prior imaging is also very important as well. So I wanna make these cases um, interactive. So I'm gonna be asking you guys some questions. You can type your responses in the chat and I'll give you, you know, a little bit of time to think about your response and what you think is going on and then we'll go from there. Again, I know that you guys might not know some of this, but um, try your best and yeah. So let's go ahead. Case number one. So case number one is a six-year-old male patient presenting with right lower quadrant abdominal pain for two days. He has tenderness to palpation in the right lower quadrant um, as per the ED doctor. He is guarding. He doesn't want his abdomen to be touched. He is nauseous. And per the parents, he had some episodes of vomiting. So in the ED, he's febrile and he has an elevated white blood cell count. So what is your top differential diagnosis and what imaging do you want to order first? Again, this is a pediatric six-year-old patient with right lower quadrant pain. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to kind of think about what's going on. Okay, good. So infection, a lot of you are questioning appendicitis, bowel obstruction. Great. So in terms of what imaging study do you want to order first? What do you guys think is the best study for this patient? Okay, we can get a CT of the abdomen, good. CAT scan, yep. Anything else other than a CAT scan? This is a pediatric patient. Good, an ultrasound of the abdomen. Um, febrile, someone asked, febrile means he has a fever. So yes, so you could get an, uh, a CT of the abdomen or, uh, and pelvis or you can get an abdominal ultrasound and because this is a pediatric patient, we're gonna go with an ultrasound. So, um, you know, he's young, we don't need to sedate him with an ultrasound. We don't need to give contrast with an ultrasound. And an ultrasound is basically an extension of the physical exam. So the ultrasound tech can ask the child, you know, where does it hurt? And they can directly scan that, that region. Um, they can also observe the patient's reaction to scanning. Is it tender when the ultrasound tech puts the probe down? Is the patient crying? Is the patient guarding with the probe? Um, and most importantly, in this, in this uh, patient population, pediatric patient population, ultrasound does not use ionizing radiation. And that's something that we keep in mind as radiologists. Um, if we do not have to radiate a patient, we won't. If there's another imaging modality that we can use, before going to CAT scan or before going to x-ray, then we will. So um, this is just an example of a normal right lower quadrant ultrasound. I'm not gonna say what's going on, but this is normal. And I, I know that many of you may not have seen an ultrasound before, but um, this is what a right lower quadrant normal ultrasound looks like. So this is what we see on our patient. So a lot of you guys already guessed it, but yes, um, this patient has acute appendicitis. So this is what we see when we scan him. We see this tubular structure right here. Um, and these are just calipers to measure the diameter of the tubular structure. So this is um, a case of acute appendicitis. Again, this is a blind ending tubular structure. So here's the blind end of the appendix. Um, and this is the proximal end where it comes off the base of the cecum. So at the proximal portion, it's measuring about five to six millimeters, which is normal. At the mid portion, it's measuring about six millimeters, which is normal. 
And then at the distal portion, it's measuring about nine millimeters and that is abnormal. Oops, sorry. So um, in cases of acute appendicitis on ultrasound, what we'll see is a dilated, thickened and non-compressible tubular structure that is blind ending. That's exactly what we see here. We could also see some periappendiceal fluid and edema. And sometimes we can even see the stone that is blocking the appendix that is causing the acute appendicitis. So um, here, this is a transverse image of the same patient of the appendix. So, you know, the, the appendix is a long worm-like structure. So if you were to kind of cut it in half and look at it face on, it would be a circle. And that's what we see here. So this is us looking at the appendix face on. And then next to the appendix is this irregular um, hypochoic fluid collection. And that actually ended up being an abscess. So this patient had ruptured appendicitis. And, you know, obviously when we read the study, we recommend surgical consultation and this patient would go to the OR and have his appendix taken out. So this is just an example of what the appendicolith or the stone in the appendix could look like. So um, calcium on ultrasound is echogenic, meaning it's bright and white. So this is the stone and because it's calcium, the ultrasound waves are not gonna be able to pass through the stone. And that's why you see darkness beyond the stone. So that's called shadowing. And that implies that this is something that is, um, you know, calcium. So either bone or a stone. So in this case, because it's in the appendix, it is a stone. All right, so just checking to see if there are any questions about this case before we head on to case number two, but I think you guys did really well with that one. So case number two, uh, case number two, we have an 18 year old female with right lower quadrant abdominal and pelvic pain for 12 hours. She also has tenderness to palpation and she's also guarding and she has nausea and vomiting. So Again, what is your top differential diagnosis or what are some things that are in your differential diagnosis and what imaging study do you wanna order first? And I'll give you guys some time to answer. Okay, possible ovarian cyst, possible ectopic pregnancy, good. Good, and yes, pelvic ultrasound, great. Good job, guys. Um, so one of the questions is, what is the importance of guarding? So guarding implies that there's something, um, you know, acute and pathologic going on. If a patient doesn't want you to touch their abdomen, um, that, you know, that means they're in a lot of pain and that there is probably something going on. So yes, let us get a pelvic ultrasound, good. So this is again, a young patient. She has abdominal and pelvic pain and ultrasound is really great in this population because, um, you know, her pain is on the right. So we can assess the appendix and see if it's acute appendicitis and we can assess the pelvic structures we can look at the uterus, we can look at the ovaries, look at the adnexal regions to see if there are any masses and that kind of stuff um, prior to going to CT, which again has ionizing radiation. So this is just an example of a normal ovary. Um, so it's this grayish blob of tissue. And then these black things in the ovary are the ovarian follicles. So again, this is normal. I just wanted to give you guys a reference image so that you knew what you were looking at when we go to the abnormal images, but um, this is what a normal ovary looks like. So when we scan our patient, this is what we see. So here is the uterus, this darker gray structure. And next to the uterus is this lighter gray structure, which is the right ovary. 
um, again, uterus, right ovary, and these are the two different planes. So we, with the ultrasound probe, we can image in the long plane, which is the sagittal plane, and then uh, in the short plane, which is transverse. So this patient's right ovary measures about 6.9 by 4.8 by 3.9 centimeters with a volume of almost 68 milliliters. And then we go to the left side. And again, here is the uterus and here is the left ovary in sagittal and transverse. So the left ovary measures 3.6 by 2.9 by two centimeters with a volume of 11 milliliters. And then for the pelvic structures, we also get blood flow images. So um, these are the blood flow images of the right ovary and the left ovary. So what do you guys think is going on? Again, she's having right lower quadrant pain. The right ovary is a lot bigger than the left ovary and we're really not seeing much flow in the right ovary. Any guesses as to what is going on? Okay, so she could have a clot blood flow blockage, very good. Cancer, cyst or a clot. Okay, these are all good. All right, so I think one person got it correct so far. So this is, yes, okay, yep. Yeah, this is a case of ovarian torsion. So in ovarian torsion, the ovary kind of twists on itself on its pedicle. And what happens uh, with that is that it cuts off its own vascular supply. And so when this happens, the ovary usually is enlarged because it becomes very edematous um, and it becomes larger than the contralateral ovary. And the follicles, so the normal follicles that we saw initially here, they become peripherally displaced in cases of ovarian torsion. So here in the right ovary, we can see a follicle here, kind of at the periphery of the right ovary, another one here, and then a few more, again, at the periphery, um, which is suggestive of ovarian torsion. Um, we can see pelvic free fluid, and we um, often on Doppler or vascular imaging, we can see variable findings. So venous flow in ovarian torsion is the first to go. Um, because veins don't have a muscular ring like arteries do, they're easily collapsible. So when the ovary twists on itself, there's nothing to prevent the vein from not, you know, closing off. Um, so little to no venous flow is pretty common um, in cases of ovarian torsion. Absent arterial flow is a little less common because arteries have that muscular wall. They can kind of stay open a bit longer. Um, so if you see normal Doppler, Doppler flow, or if you see normal arterial flow on um, an ovarian ultrasound, that doesn't mean that there is not ovarian torsion. Um, and normal vascularity does not rule out torsion. So if we put the ovary side by side, we can see that the right ovary is grossly edematous. It's almost seven times the size of the left ovary. We saw those small peripherally oriented follicles. And in this case, you know, the patient doesn't have venous flow and doesn't have um, arterial flow. So the left ovary, we see the Doppler flow in the left ovary itself. In the right ovary, we don't really see any flow. There's some peripheral flow, which may be, um, you know, like a pelvic vessel or maybe in the uterus, but there's no flow within the ovary itself. So this is um, a case of ovarian torsion. So one of the questions asked is how does this happen? Um, so torsion occurs mainly due to two main reasons. What, one is hypermobility of the ovary. Um, it just naturally has the ability to move. Um, and 
The other reason is an adnexal mass, and this is more common. So if a patient has a large para-ovarian cyst, or if they have a dermoid cyst or a malignancy, um, that kind of serves as a lead point for the ovary to you know, kind of twist on itself because now it's very heavy and it, um, it's not as stable in the pelvis, that can lead to ovarian torsion. Um, the treatment for ovarian torsion is surgery. So if we get the patient to the OR soon enough, the ovary can be salvaged. Um, in this case, you know, it's, who knows if it could be salvaged because there is no vascular flow anymore. So um, we don't know how long the ovary has been without flow. And if something is not getting blood flow, it's going to become necrotic and the tissue is going to die. And if that happens, then the ovary will have to be removed. But if they untwist the ovary in the OR and it starts to pinken up with the blood flow and starts to look like normal ovarian tissue again, then they can salvage it and um, they'll just tack it down so it doesn't twist again. All right, so let's move on to the next case. So case number three is a 37 year old female with cramping abdominal pain. She is nauseous, she's vomiting and her abdomen is distended. And um, per her chart, she has a remote history of abdominal surgery about 10 years ago. So in this case, what is your top differential diagnosis and what imaging study do you want to order first? I'll give you guys a few seconds to think about what's going on and see what you'd want to order. Scar tissue obstruction, bobulus, okay. Gallbladder stones. Okay, correct. Constipation, abdominal ultrasound, bowel obstruction, good. So one person said, let's get a CT abdomen and pelvis. So yes, so in this case, um, the ED will often just go straight to a CT abdomen and pelvis just because the bowel isn't well assessed on ultrasound. So, um, you could also get an x-ray first. So if you get an x-ray, you want to get supine, which is when the patient is laying down, and erect radiographs, which is when the patient is standing up. And the reason for this is if the patient uh, is erect or sitting up or standing, free air will rise and go underneath the diaphragm. Um, and if you see free air, that obviously means that something bad is going on and there's something that perforated in the abdomen. If you get a CT um, and you want to assess the bowel, it's a good idea to give oral contrast because that can help. It's not necessary, but it is helpful. So here is an image of a normal abdominal ultrasound, uh, sorry, a normal abdominal x-ray. Um, this is the spine. Here is the pelvic structures. And this is, so this black over here is gas within a large bowel loop. We can see gas in stool in the large bowel. And then there's some gas in small bowel loops in the mid abdomen as well. So this is normal. Um, you know, it's normal to have a little bit of stool and gas in the colon. So when we get x-rays on our patient, this is what we see. So what are you guys thinking with these x-rays? And I'll also show you the CT that we got. So this is the CAT scan for the patient. And so what do you think is going on now based on these imaging studies?
Okay. Someone said constipation or bowel obstruction. Obstruction. Good. Good. So most of you guys got this right. So this is a case of small bowel obstruction. So here we see dilated loops of small bowel and the small bowel should really never be more than three centimeters in diameter. So these are all dilated more than three centimeters. Um, they're fluid filled, they're distended. Um, we see here air fluid levels. So this is when the air in the small bowel loops rises and then distal to the air is like this straight line cutoff. So that's fluid beneath the air. Um, and that is also a sign that we see in small bowel obstruction. On CT scans, we can see what is called a small bowel feces sign. So typically you only see stool in the colon. Um, small bowel usually only ever has fluid in it. So if you see small bowel that has material that you know looks like stool, that could imply that there's an obstruction or at least you know delayed transit um, because that material has been sitting there for a long period of time, hasn't really moved anywhere and is now starting to become more fecal-like. And then distal to the obstruction on a CAT scan, we would see normal caliber small bowel loops because after the obstruction, you know, the air and the stool and the material can pass normally. But before the obstruction, um, there's a point that is preventing stuff from going through. And so all of those loops before the obstruction are going to become dilated. So um, in this case, there is no free air, thankfully. Um, so this patient did not perforate. Um, this air right here is just the stomach and normal air within the stomach. Um, and let's see. Uh, yeah, so this patient actually ended up having a history of abdominal surgery for, for colonic diverticulitis. Um, and they ended up going to the OR and having surgery for their small bowel obstruction and the surgery confirmed adhesions um, as the cause for small bowel obstruction. All right. So last case for you guys is case number four. So we have a 56 year old male with left lower quadrant abdominal pain. He is obese. Um, he is tender to palpation in the left lower quadrant. He has a fever and he has an elevated white count. So again, what is your top differential and what do you want to order? Any guesses? Okay, infection, good. He has a fever and he has an elevated white count. So you could get an abdominal ultrasound, true. X-ray or CT, kidney infection, diverticulitis, CT, KUB, good. So yeah, in this case, um, you know, the ED would probably go straight to a CT as well, just because again, the patient is obese. So we're not going to be able to see very well with an ultrasound if we try to scan through all of that soft tissue with just an ultrasound probe. And plus the patient, um, his tenderness is in the lower quadrant. So imaging the lower quadrant with an ultrasound is going to be difficult as well. So in this case, we are going to order a CAT scan. So um, usually in these situations with patients who pre present like this, uh, the ED would order a CAT scan with IV and oral contrast. But if they don't, you can still, you know, look at the images and make a diagnosis. Um, but oral contrast is really helpful to evaluate the bowel and IV contrast is really helpful to evaluate the solid organs. 
So this is just a normal CAT scan image of the pelvis. So these white loops of bowel are all small bowel loops that are filled with oral contrast. This is the rectum and this loopy piece of bowel is the sigmoid colon. So this is normal, you know, this is what a normal pelvic slice through a CT of a CT would look like. So when we scan our patient, this is what we see. And a lot of you guys already guessed it right. So this is a case of acute diverticulitis. So we see that the sigmoid colon is thickened, it's inflamed, there's stranding of the surrounding fat and mesentery. Um, there is you know, enhancement of the thickened colonic wall. And the patient also has a lot of colonic diverticuli. So diverticuli are these little outpouchings of the colonic mucosa, um, which result due to increased intraluminal pressure and a lack of dietary fiber. So the sigmoid colon actually has the highest intraluminal pressure of the entire colon and it has the narrowest caliber. So that's where colonic diverticuli are most likely to form. And diverticulitis results uh, as a result of an obstruction of the diverticular neck. And then that leads to inflammation and possible perforation and infection. So this is log long segment uh, sigmoid colon diverticulitis. And if we take a careful look, we actually see this adjacent um, air and fluid filled structure and there's surrounding straining of the pelvic fat. So normally you want the pelvic fat to be nice and dark, just like this subcutaneous fat out here. But this pelvic fat looks, you know, a little dirty. It's not super clean, um, has a lot of light gray stuff going on. So that's implying that there's induration around this thing. And this thing actually ended up being a abscess. So when you have perforation of a diverticula, you can develop abscess. And um, this, you know, sometimes if the abscesses get large, uh, IR will put a drain in and kind of have all the material, purulent material drain out and have the abscess collapse on itself. But if it's small, then sometimes these just resolve on their own with antibiotics. And another complication of acute diverticulitis is perforation. So um, obviously if you have an abscess then you've perforated, but even if you don't have an abscess, you could still have perforation. So this locule of air right here um, on the lateral aspect of the colon, it's not within a bowel loop and it's not really within a diverticula. So this is actually a small amount of extraluminal gas, um, which implies that this is a case of complicated diverticulitis with acute perforation. So that's all I have for you guys. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, I guess there's no more questions. So we will thank you, Dr. Sindhu, for presenting for our web shadowers. We loved your in-depth description of radiology and it was such an honor to have you and learn from you. Everyone make sure you check out her social media to learn more from her. Her Instagram, <laughs> excuse me, her Instagram is at Dr. Aisha Sindhu. The link to today's Google form has been posted in the chat box and will be posted in the description of the video shortly. Please make sure you fill it out within the next 30 minutes for us to receive verification of your attendance and please tune in to our next session.